Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. A few years ago, I posted a video called Spectacular Approach to JFK Airport and it proved to be the most viewed video on this channel. So why not fly the same approach again, but during night conditions? In this video, I'm on a flight arriving at JFK Airport from Salt Lake City. This video will be uninterrupted from 19,000 feet to the runway, and in typical Peter Masella style, it will be entirely narrated, so you don't just get a view out the window, but you'll develop a deep and comprehensive understanding of why it takes 14 minutes from overflying Manhattan to landing at JFK. We're approaching New York City from the west on what's called the Lendy 8 arrival, and our nose is pointed toward an airspace fix called Lendy, which is located over Elmwood Park, New Jersey. Elmwood Park is just east of the much larger Patterson, which we're looking at below. Patterson is easily identifiable by the Passaic River, which borders part of this city of over 150,000 people. We're about to pass over Lendy, and we've been cleared down to 19,000 feet to cross Lendy at this specific altitude. 19,000 feet keeps us above flights leaving the New York City area to the west. Traditionally, after Lendy, we would fly directly to a navigational aid at LaGuardia Airport located near the runway 22 pier in the East River called the LaGuardia VOR. However, traffic at this time is very light, and the approach controller has given us a heading to pass slightly south of LaGuardia without having to fly directly over it. I'm happy about this because this will allow me to see more of Manhattan, all of the Bronx, LaGuardia Airport itself, and part of Northern Queens while we fly just south of LaGuardia. The controller is having us descend to stepped lower altitudes. We can now see the Hudson River, which at this point separates New York and New Jersey. Spanning the Hudson River is the George Washington Bridge, a 4,760 foot long suspension bridge of two levels connecting Fort Lee, New Jersey with the Washington Heights neighborhood of Manhattan. The river is very easy to identify at night. It's just a long area of darkness with the well-illuminated bridge lit well. On the east side of the bridge, we can see Upper Manhattan bordered by the Harlem River to its east, and the rectangular Central Park is clearly visible. To the northeast of Manhattan is the Bronx, the only part of New York City on the mainland USA, and east of Manhattan is Queens, the New York City borough that this airplane will be landing at. Even though we can see Queens now, it will take another 14 minutes before we can land at Kennedy Airport because of our high altitude. We need to be high up at this point to remain clear of departing flights from other New York City airports that use the airspace below us to gain altitude. This includes departures from LaGuardia, Newark, and White Plains that can climb as high as 12,000 feet in this airspace. It's not until we proceed a bit further that we can descend further with much of the descent occurring over the Atlantic Ocean, an area with less conflict from nearby airports. Today, at JFK Airport, we will land on runway 22 left. Because we're passing by LaGuardia Airport, I'm going to take a moment to focus on LaGuardia Airport. All flights coming to LaGuardia Airport from the west actually land about 10 to 15 minutes earlier than flights from JFK because of the high approach to JFK that we need to follow. The final approach is just a few miles away from where we are, and the quickest way to get there would be to descend to a very low altitude, fly over the north shore of Long Island, make a right-hand turn and land, but we can't do that, so it's out toward the Atlantic Ocean where we need to head. We're about to start a slow right-hand turn now, as prescribed by the approach controller. We'll actually fly right over Kennedy Airport's vicinity at a high altitude before reaching the ocean, and there we'll descend further then enter a series of left-hand turns over the land to swing around and land on runway 22 left. All of the turns that we made are decided upon by a controller on the ground who sees our aircraft as a blip on our radar screen, and the turns are issued based upon how much traffic there is in the area. The altitude descent clearances are generally issued based upon standard locations. For example, at a point where New York area airport departures can climb to a certain altitude, we will be told to descend to an altitude just higher than that. However, based upon additional air traffic in the area, we may be issued amendments to our altitude. Traffic was very light during the time of this arrival, so we'll be given expeditious turns to descend to the runway. From here, we can clearly see all of Long Island on this crisp visibility environment. Nassau County is in the foreground with Suffolk County in the distance. And just past the north shore of Long Island on the left, we can see the state of Connecticut. The dark area on the right is the Atlantic Ocean. That's where we're headed so we can descend safely over the water and make a series of left-hand turns eventually to fly back over Long Island, continuing around to the airport. If we were to fly to LaGuardia Airport, we'd be very low approaching New York City and would spend minimal time within the boroughs, and we would land right away. But because JFK arrivals from the west have to overfly LaGuardia's airspace, we need to fly high over the boroughs, steering clear of LaGuardia flights, then descend over the ocean. 
If we were to approach JFK from the east, we'd have a more direct approach, descending low over Long Island, then proceeding swiftly to JFK. The most complicated thing about coming in from the east is being vectored onto the final approach course with traffic approaching from different directions. Only small adjustments in altitude would need to be made for the smaller airports in Long Island. But because we're approaching from the west, this makes for a very complicated and extended approach to the final approach course to any runway before we can line up and land. This is also true for flights approaching from the north, which generally commence the approach from the same area that we did by Patterson, New Jersey. Flights approaching JFK from the south have are the simplest. They can descend rapidly over the Atlantic since there's very little air traffic in that area, and they can be vectored quickly to the final approach course to the active runway at JFK. Now, back to us. I mentioned that we're making a series of left-hand turns to get to the landing runway, runway 22 left. The reason for the left turns is that it keeps us away from LaGuardia's airspace. We'll be flying to the east of JFK when turning to the north, then west. The east side lacks flights to and from LaGuardia. However, our turns are all based on the fact that we'll be landing on runway 22 left. Runway 22 left is being used for arrivals because it will allow for a headwind. If we were to land, say, on runway 31 right, which faces Manhattan, we would actually descend to the west of JFK. However, we'd be at a high altitude, steering clear of LaGuardia flights. Then we'd descend lower over the ocean before turning to the left to line up with the runway. If we were to land on runway 4 right, the opposite direction that we'll be landing today, we'd pass by JFK to the east at a high altitude, then descend lower over the ocean, and we'll turn right to join the runway to the northeast to land. As you can see, the airspace over the ocean plays a very important role for flights going to JFK from certain directions. There are no airports in the ocean and very little air traffic at a low altitude there. This makes the ocean the perfect place for the controller to sequence aircraft at lower altitudes before being vectored onto the final approach course to the appropriate runway. And that's exactly what's happening right now. We've been told to make a left-hand turn heading towards the east over the Atlantic Ocean. We're also being told to descend to lower altitudes. This is the perfect airspace to do so. Do note that because traffic is very light, we actually did not go very far out over the ocean at all, but if there were many airplanes coming to JFK, we would actually proceed further south into the ocean before making the left-hand turn. Virtually all arrivals to JFK, except those arriving from the east and landing on runway 22 left, will spend significant time over the ocean, so even if the Atlantic Ocean doesn't seem like it's part of your flight route, it may play an important role for your plane to land. Because the traffic is actually really, really light today, the controller is having us turn further to the left to the northeast to set up for a downwind leg. We can actually see Kennedy Airport on the screen right now. It's that little boxy area just to the right of Jamaica Bay. We're being set up for the downwind leg to runway 22 left. We'll fly in the opposite direction of landing, and then we'll make a left-hand turn to join a left base leg, and then another left-hand turn to join the final approach course. We're actually going to proceed over the land in just a moment. Despite being so close to JFK and having flown past it, we have about another 10 minutes to go before we touch down. And this is an expedited approach since we spent minimal time over the ocean today. We're flying in the vicinity of the Wontaw State Parkway and have descended to 4,000 feet. Our lower altitude now allows departures from JFK to fly over us. We made this transition from being above the departures to below the departures while somewhere over the ocean. Way in the distance is Manhattan and you can see the glow of Manhattan's lights in the night sky. From here on, every turn that we will make will be a left-hand turn as we continue along and we'll get clearance to descend further so that we can intercept the final approach course. We're going to be lined up with the runway at approximately 10 miles out and in order to get there we have to proceed toward the north shore of Long Island. This is the second time we'll be near the north shore of Long Island. The first time was when we were near LaGuardia and the northern part of Queens. We since then proceeded to the south shore, out over the ocean, and now we're headed back north. This is the only way for us to get to runway 22 left as we can only intercept the final approach course via a left-hand turn. A right-hand turn isn't allowed due to conflicts with LaGuardia. Arrivals coming from the south follow the same path as us after having descended over the ocean, and arrivals coming from the east will have started off in Suffolk County along the north shore of island, they'll make several turns over the island, and then they'll join a left-hand turn for landing. We're in a left-hand turn now over the towns of the southern part of Long Island. While most aircraft flying to JFK from the direction we came from will overfly this area to get to runway 22 left, the exact position will vary from aircraft to aircraft. It really depends on how many planes there are. We could be issued turns to keep us further east, or we may make some zigzag turns before we're lined up, but this approach is simple today with basic left-hand turns only. This type of radar vectoring is common for any airport where you need to approach the runway from the opposite direction that you're coming from. For example, if you're flying to LaGuardia from the south and will land on runway 22 with right traffic, you could either fly up the Hudson or over Manhattan. You could turn your base leg over the Bronx or head up toward Connecticut before landing. It all depends on the traffic load. 
Here at JFK, the situation can become even more unique. I mentioned that runway 22 left will be the landing runway, but runway 22 right can be also used as the landing runway simultaneously with runway 22 left. This allows for aircraft to be closer to each other in this left turn traffic pattern as they can be separated from each other horizontally as they'll land on separate runways. This allows nearly double the amount of aircraft to land around the same time, but today runway 22 left is the only arrival runway being used. Runway 22 right is being used as the departure runway, so we're proceeding further along to get into position to land. It's up to the approach controller to vector all of these aircraft so that they can intercept the final approach course to runway 22 left at approximately 10 miles out. And speaking of this approach controller, we're actually overflying the physical location of the controller. The approach controller is physically located in a radar room known as the TRACON, or Terminal Radar Approach Control. The New York TRACON is down below in Nassau in Westbury. The facility handles traffic to and from all of the New York area airports, but the controller assigned to us is focusing specifically on arrivals to JFK, as well as the aircraft that will cross paths of the arrivals. So we've been talking to the approach controller all the way from around Patterson, New Jersey, and we'll continue this relationship until we're lined up with the runway. At that point, we'll switch to the controlled zone of the control tower at the airport. In order to get lined up with the runway at around the 10 mile mark, we need to continue on this heading for a bit further as we move from Southern Long Island to Northern Long Island. We do, however, receive further instructions to descend to even lower altitudes as we need to eventually wind up at the altitude indicated for at the point of the glide slope that will intercept. The controller also issues speed restrictions, telling us to go slower and slower to fit behind other aircraft that are slower and approaching the runway. Eventually, we'll need to wind up at our final approach speed so we can touch down on the runway. This is a carefully orchestrated ballet. While most passengers may be wondering when we'll land, since we seem to have already entered and exited the New York City area, the controller is hard at work making sure we'll get back into the city as safely as possible. We're now passing by the Long Island Expressway from south to north. It's actually our second time crossing this highway as we passed over it from north to south while flying over Queens. We'll pass over it once again as we land. We're at a point where the controller needs to decide when to turn us back around, and that's going to happen in a few moments. The controller is taking into consideration how far we are behind the previous aircraft. This is Kennedy Airport, and there are many wide-body aircraft that can produce significant wake turbulence. This can lead to larger gaps between aircraft on approach. It's important not to get too close, especially behind aircraft like 747s and A380s, which fly to JFK. Our left turn is called a left base leg, and it points our nose toward Manhattan. We'll be on this left base leg for a few miles until we intercept the final approach course and proceed directly to the runway for landing. If runway 22 right were also in use for landing, there could potentially be aircraft off our right side mimicking what we're doing, but during this rather quiet time, all arrivals are landing one behind the other for runway 22 left. We have slowed down significantly at this point, and the controller is preparing to clear us for the approach to the runway. We're on the radar scope of the control tower at the airport, as well as on the scope of the approach controller who we're still talking to. We'll intercept the final approach course by turning left to a heading of 224 degrees, which is the heading of runway 22 left. That's to the southwest. Once we're established on the final approach course, we'll be handed over to the control tower, which is physically located at Terminal 4 JFK. For now, though, we just have to keep moving to the west as we look toward the south shore of Long Island. We can see the Atlantic Ocean, the dark area, in the distance. Passengers seated on the right side of the aircraft can see Long Island's north shore, which we're closer to than the south shore. The towns that we see below are the towns on the far western end of Nassau County. When we make our next left turn toward the runway, we'll still be seeing the towns on the western side of Nassau County, but we'll be flying roughly over the border between Nassau and Queens, so passengers on the right will see Queens only. What I'm most excited about for being seated on the left side of the plane is that since we'll be making a left turn to line up with the runway, I should be able to see the runway from this side of the plane since conditions are clear and crisp. So I'm keeping an eye out for the runway in the distance ahead. We should intercept the final approach course on an angle at or less than around 40 degrees. It's JFK's shortest runway, so it won't be very easy to find, but I'm searching for runway light characteristics such as runway side markings, an approach lighting system, and a visual approach slope indicator just off the left side of the runway. Sometimes night conditions can actually make it easier to find the runway because of the runway lights. The runways and taxiways themselves are dark, so the lights on the sides can help make it easier to find. I know we're about to make our final left turn really soon, so I'm scanning the area just below the Atlantic Ocean. I know the runway is there. Ah, I finally see it. It's on the top right of the screen, and it's easily identifiable since its lights differ from the lights of the towns below. Runway 22 left is 8,400 feet long. It's JFK's shortest runway. I'm zooming into the runway now before it moves out of sight, because we're nearly lined up with the runway at this point. Only a few more seconds remain until we're on the 224 degree heading. 
we're exactly three minutes from touchdown. It's at this point where we leave the control zone of the controller at the Treecon in Westbury. The controller asks us to check in with Kennedy Tower, the recognizable air traffic control facility at Terminal 4. At 338 feet in the sky, the tower controller, also known as the local controller, can not only see us on the radar scope, but looking out the window to the northeast provides a view of our aircraft's lights. The tower controller's job is to monitor us from this point to vacating the runway after landing, ensuring that we're safely separated from any other aircraft on or near the approach. The objective is to issue us landing clearance when conditions are safe to do so. With receipt of landing clearance from the tower, we can proceed ahead and land on the runway. In the cockpit, the flight deck crew is making final preparations to land. This includes lowering the landing gear and setting the flaps for landing. All we need to do is descend and continue forward as the plane is flown and the tower monitors us. We're flying over the Beth David Cemetery in Elmont in Nassau County as we fly down the border between Queens and Nassau. After Elmont, we'll clearly see Valley Stream, also in Nassau. It's only at a point at around two miles out that the land immediately to our left will be part of Queens, but that area of Queens only extends for about a mile as Nassau will be directly behind it. We're over a very densely populated area with homes on both sides of the plane. For a short period, we're flying directly over the Belt Parkway, which will lead to a marshy area just before we touch down. Think about how far we've come and how many turns we've made since this video started. 15 minutes ago, we were over Patterson, New Jersey. We flew over Manhattan, Queens, the ocean, Nassau County, and now we're back in Queens, all to safely get around the complex New York City airspace. With other airports traffic in the way from approaching from the west, this is the only way to get to where we are now, the final approach course to runway 22 left. We can now safely land. I hope you enjoyed this comprehensive approach video. If you're new to my channel, this is what my channel is all about. I take an ordinary flight and explain it from a point of view so that the viewer is situationally aware as to what's going on outside. With these videos, you can apply this information to the next flight that you take. Rather than focusing on power plugs or seat pitch, my aim is to introduce you to a different side of flying. No matter what airline or class of service you're in, all flights are equal, and understanding this makes the flying experience more enjoyable. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to subscribe to my channel so that you're made aware of when I post more unique videos like this. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you learned something to take with you on your next journey in the sky. Welcome to JFK.